This is Microbiology, Chapter 1, The Microbial World and You. So this class is called Microbiology, where we study microorganisms, microbial organisms. Right? But what is a microbe? So microbes or microorganisms are tiny living things that are much too small to be seen with the unaided eye. So you can only see them with a microscope. So this is why they're called microorganisms. So there are five main types of microbes that we'll look at. So we have bacteria, viruses, fungi, so things like yeast and molds, mushrooms, algae, protozoa. Um, so these are really single-celled parasites things like amoebas. We also have some multicellular parasites that may have microscopic life stages. Though there are lots of different types of microbes out there, only a very select few are actually pathogenic or disease causing. Most microbes are generally neutral or even beneficial. So some microbes help to decompose organic waste. Some microbes produce oxygen via photosynthesis. Some microbes are able to produce desirable chemical products that we can use, so things like vitamins. Microbes can also produce fermented foods and beverages that we enjoy, so things like cheese and bread and wine. They can also help produce products that we use in manufacturing and disease treatment. So we can use microbes to kind of mass produce insulin for diabetic patients. So having a knowledge in microorganisms can allow us to prevent food spoilage, help prevent and treat disease, um, and then understand causes and transmission of diseases to help prevent epidemics and pandemics. Right? So the more you know about a subject, the better prepared you'll be for whatever may come. Humans share a close relationship with microbes as well. So an adult human is composed of roughly 30 trillion body cells that are your own cells. And then you can have up to 100 trillion more bacterial cells on and in your body. So 100 trillion friends you didn't know you had. So this is collectively referred to as the microbiome. So the microbiome is just a group of microbes that are going to live on or in the human body. So most of these will be neutral or beneficial. So they're going to help to maintain good health uh, by helping with our digestion. Um, they help produce some vitamins for us that we can't produce on our own. They can help to prevent the growth of bad or pathogenic microbes. So if your good microbes are using up all of the resources your body has to offer, there won't be any left for a potential pathogenic infection to take hold. They also help to train the immune system to discriminate between threats and recognize foreign invaders. So during development in utero, right, the fetus is in a sterile environment in the womb. Humans begin to become colonized by these microorganisms that form the microbiome almost immediately after birth. So once these microbiome bacteria take hold and find a home in or on your body, they'll probably stay there indefinitely. However, there are some that are referred to as transient microbiota. Um, so they only colonize the body during a short time. Generally, colonization by a specific bacterial species can only occur at particular body sites that are going to provide those necessary nutrients and the right environment for that particular microbe to flourish. And again, your normal microbiota, your microbiome, is harmless bacteria as long as it stays where it should, right? So we have E. coli in the digestive tract, right? Um, in the colon. So that's where it's supposed to be when it doesn't cause any problems. But if the E. coli happens to get into the urinary tract, now it's going to lead to a urinary tract infection. So in this example, E. coli is considered more of an opportunistic pathogen. So under normal conditions, it won't cause any problems or infections. But if it sees the opportunity 
Okay, so if the opportunity arises for it to colonize another body area and cause infection, it will. So looking at naming and classifying these microorganisms. So the scientific nomenclature system that we still use today was established by Carolus Linnaeus in the 1700s. So you all probably remember this from high school biology. Right? So the classification hierarchy right, for all living things. So in this system, we can try to show um, relationships between different species, how closely related they are on kind of this tree or this pyramid. But ultimately, every individual species uh, will have its own unique genus and species name. So every organism has two names, two scientific names, the genus and the specific epithet, or the genus and the species. So the scientific name for a dog right, is Canis familiaris. So Canis being your genus, familiaris being the species or the specific epithet. So when utilizing this binomial or two name nomenclature naming system, um, these scientific names, there's a few rules and guidelines. So scientific names are always italicized or underlined right, if we are typing Generally, all scientific names are in Latin because it is the universal scientific language. The genus is always capitalized and the species is always lowercase. So another good thing about this binomial nomenclature system is that no two organisms can have the same name. It's also useful for sharing scientific information um, across different countries and languages. So this example, a cat, right, to us in English, right, is referred to as a cat, right, but maybe in Mexico right, or, or Spanish-speaking country, right, it's a gato. Different languages have different you know, words for these organisms. So in order to kind of have that base standard, we use scientific names. Also, scientific names may be descriptive of the organism, um, or they may honor a scientist that was involved some way with that organism. Right, so some examples, uh, E. coli, well-known bacteria, Escherichia coli, is named after the discoverer of this bacteria, Theodore Escherich. So the species name, coli, is going to describe the general habitat of this organism, right, which would be in the colon or the large intestine. Another example is Staphylococcus aureus. So Staphylococcus tells us that we have spherical coccus shaped cells right, that are in a staphylo or clustered arrangement. Aureus tells us it has a gold color right, or pigment to these colonies. So some different types of microorganisms that we'll look at um, in this chapter include bacteria, which will be our main focus throughout the semester, uh, archaea, which we'll touch on briefly, which are kind of ancient bacteria, fungi, so yeast, molds, mushrooms, uh, protozoa, things like amoebas, algae, viruses, and multicellular animal parasites. Bacteria are classified as prokaryotes, meaning that they do not have a nucleus. Right? So these are more primitive type cells than, say, animal cells. Bacteria are always um, going to be single celled. Right? So prokaryotes are simple single celled organisms that do not contain a nucleus. Another distinguishing feature of bacteria is they contain peptidoglycan in their cell walls, which we will talk about in our next chapter. Bacteria divide via binary fission, so they don't undergo sexual reproduction like animals do. They basically just split in half and make clones and copies of themselves. But this mechanism of reproduction allows them to grow most exponentially. Bacteria can get their nutrition from organic or inorganic chemicals. So they have wide varieties of diets and nutrients that they can utilize. Um, and some may be photosynthetic. So they may be able to just use sunlight to generate their own energy.
And some bacteria are capable of locomotion and swimming by using appendages called flagella. Right? So kind of the whip-like tail on a sperm is a flagella. Bacteria can also contain these tails for swimming. So archaea are also prokaryotes or pre-nucleus like bacteria. So they do not have a nucleus. They're very primitive type cells. Some of the theorize the earliest types of living cells um, or archaea because they often live in these extreme environments that are similar to the conditions of the earth, early earth, when life is thought to have uh, began. So archaea are different from bacteria in that they do not have peptidoglycan in their cell walls. Uh, they have a different molecule that we'll look at later, um, or some may not even have a cell wall at all. So because these are more rare and they don't like to hang out in places where humans hang out, right? We don't live in hydrothermal vents um, or these extreme environments. Um, so they're generally not known to cause disease in humans. Fungi are considered eukaryotes, so they do have a nucleus that surrounds and protects the DNA. Um, their distinguishing feature is chitin cell walls. So fungi depend on absorbing organic chemicals for their energy. So they're considered saprophytes, meaning that they mostly live off of dead organic material. So fungi are very important for uh, breaking down and recycling plant matter around the world. Yeasts are unicellular or single cell type of fungi. So this is what we use for baking bread, making beer uh, and other fermentation processes. Molds and mushrooms are the multicellular forms of fungi. So a mold would consist of kind of a mass or interweaving mycelia, uh, which are composed of these filaments called hyphae. So they all just kind of stick out and interlace together. Protozoa are eukaryotes, again, meaning that they do have a nucleus. Um, so they are able to absorb and ingest organic molecules as well. So these include things like amoebas, so protozoa may be modal, meaning they're able to move around. So they could have pseudopods, which are kind of these fake feet that they can pull themselves and drag along with. Uh, they could have cilia or those tail-like flagella. Protozoa may be free-living or parasitic. Some are even photosynthetic. Protozoa can reproduce either via sexual reproduction or asexually. Algae are eukaryotes that contain cellulose in their cell wall, similar to plants. So they're kind of like little single-celled plants. You can find algae in freshwater, saltwater, the soil, pretty much everywhere outside. So they use photosynthesis for their energy production. As a byproduct of that photosynthesis, they're going to release oxygen and produce their own sugar, carbohydrates. And they're also capable of both sexual and asexual reproduction. So viruses are kind of our gray area of biology. So they're not technically considered to be a living thing. So later on, we talk about you know, cell theory. So basically, to be considered a living thing, you have to have at least one cell, right? you have to be a complete cell. Viruses are not composed of cells, so they are acellular. Viruses are essentially either DNA or RNA, genetic material, that is um, kind of surrounded by a protein coat, and that protein coat may or may not be enveloped in a lipid envelope, right? just for an extra layer of protection. So if a virus is not infecting a living host cell, they are inert. So they lack the cellular machinery, the me metabolic machinery to kind of reproduce on their own. Right? So they have to infect a living cell and then they kind of hijack your cell's um, machinery and parts to make new viruses for them. Multicellular animal parasites are eukaryotes and considered multicellular animals, mostly um, referred to as helmets or the worms. Um, so they're not strictly microorganisms. Obviously, you can see these worms without a microscope, but we do lump them in with the study of microbiology because they can have some microscopic stages in their life cycle. 
So this is showing the removal of a parasitic guinea worm. So it's theorized that this procedure was the basic design for the rod of Asclepius. So the symbol of our medical profession. Right, so it's kind of a worm wrapped around that stick. The classification system that we use for microorganisms and all living organisms was developed by Carl Wosey in 1978. So he devised three domains based on a basic cellular structure and organization. So we already talked about bacteria, right? So they are characterized by um, being prokaryotic. They don't have a nucleus and they contain peptidoglycan in their cell walls. The archaea are the kind of archaic or the ancient bacteria. So think like archaeology, just really ancient bacteria that live in those extreme environments. So these are more rare, um, but they're also prokaryotes. They don't have a nucleus, um, but they do not have peptidoglycan, right? So that's kind of the distinguishing feature, the change between these two. Um, and then eukarya, eukaryotes do have a nucleus, right? So their DNA is contained and protected within that nucleus. Um, and then we can divide eukarya up into uh, different kingdoms. So we have uh, protists, so things like amoebas, fungi, right? So your molds, mushrooms, and yeast, plants, and animals. So the study of microbiology would not exist without the microscope. So one of the first microscopes was used by Robert Hooke in the mid to late 1600s. So he was the first to report that living things are composed of little boxes or cells. Right? So this began what we know today as cell theory. So cell theory just states that all living things are composed of cells, right? And all living things come from other cells, right? All cells come from other cells. The first microbes were also discovered in the mid to late 1600s by Anton van Leeuwenhoek. So he called these animalcules that he saw through um, this very early type of microscope. So kind of animal molecules. And so they weren't really sure what they were looking at. They just knew there was something definitely um, going on in this microscopic world that we've just been granted access to. So back during this time in the 16, 1700s, um, spontaneous generation was the prevailing kind of train of thought. So basically, life arises from non-living matter. So there's some vital force that is creating life. So an example, um, recipe for mice. So you take some dirty clothes, some wheat, give it some time, maybe 21 days, and then you should have some mice show up. So some type of mystical force has combined the elements of the dirty clothes and the wheat to create mice. So basically in an effort to disprove this theory of spontaneous generation led to the development of what we know today as the scientific method. So the scientific method is basically how we know um, everything we know in science and know it to be true or without a reasonable doubt. So the counter argument to spontaneous generation was biogenesis. Um, so biogenesis states that Living cells can only arise from pre-existing living cells, right? So life can only come from other life. It's not going to just spontaneously appear out of thin air, right? So this experiment was performed by Francesco Reddy in the mid-1600s. So our control group would just be an open jar with the meat. So obviously maggots are going to appear. So in it scientific experiment, your control group would be what happens if we just leave it alone as is and we don't change anything, right? So then we can see the effect of our change of covering the jar. So he learned if he covered the jar, the maggots no longer appeared on the meat. So the flies had to have access to the meat for the maggots to appear. Therefore, the flies were responsible for the maggots. Some other experiments done in the 1700s, um, so say we're 100 years later and the debate over spontaneous generation is still going on at this point. 
Uh, but Needham and Lazaro had boiled nutrient broth. So think maybe like a chicken broth that they put into a flask. So if you boil it, right, you're going to kill whatever is in it. Right, you let it cool. Our control group, the flask was left open. So anything that was in the air could float down into the broth and contaminate it. Right? And then we would see that growth. Right? However, if we sealed the flask after we boiled it right, and we waited, there would be no growth. Right, so we sterilized it and then we remove the point of entry for any new microbes to get in. Right, but if we reopen the flask, they can get in from the air right, and then they're going to grow and contaminate our broth. So again, these help to show that life is not just coming out of nowhere. So there's something in the air right, that is causing this growth. So about another 100 years later, in the 1800s, right, they're still kind of arguing between spontaneous generation and biogenesis. So in the 1850s, Rudolph or Chow um, came up with cell theory. Um, so cell theory and the theory of biogenesis. Right? So basically saying that cells must arise from pre-existing cells. Right, and life can only be formed from existing life. So biogenesis, the beginning of life, right, has to come from life. So it wasn't until the mid to late 1800s that the argument for spontaneous generation was finally put to bed by Louis Pasteur. So Louis Pasteur demonstrated that microorganisms are present in the air. So remember, according to spontaneous generation, life can arise spontaneously from non-living matter. Um, so Pasteur's experiment showed that microbes are present in non-living matter. Right? They can still cause um, these effects. So in his experiment, he poured beef broth into a long-necked flask. Right? So obviously there's microbes present in the broth. It hasn't been sterilized. So he heated the broth to sterilize it. Um, and as it was boiling, he bent the neck of the flask into kind of an S shape. So after boiling, we killed any microbes that were present. So now we have a sterile solution. So then leaving this to sit for a while and wait, over long periods of time, microbes never appeared in the broth, right? So the broth still remained um, sterile. So this is showing that the microbes are in the air itself, kind of floating around. So if our solution, if our liquid is not exposed to that air, then it will not become contaminated, right? So if any microbes land from the air um, into the flask, right, they're only going to go so far. They're not going to be able to go all the way up, right, back into the broth. So this bin prevented those microbes from entering into the flasks. And actually some of Pasteur's original flasks are still on display at the Pasteur Institute in Paris. So it's been over a hundred years since he's done these experiments and they still are completely sterile with no sign of contamination. So ultimately this led to Pasteur proving that these microbes were responsible for our food spoilage, food and beverage spoilage. So now that we know that microbes are causing our foods and drinks to spoil and go bad, now we can try to prevent that. So beginning with Pasteur's work led to kicking off what's known as the golden age of microbiology. So in a relatively short time period, uh, we had some major breakthroughs and discoveries in the field of microbiology. So including the relationship between microbes and disease, so our germ theory of disease, um, as well as immunity and antimicrobial drugs, There's things like antibiotics. Pasteur showed that microbes are responsible for fermentation. So fermentation is the microbial conversion of sugar to alcohol in the absence of oxygen. So that same type of microbial growth that causes fermentation is also going to cause spoilage for foods and beverages. So the bacteria that use the air um, will spoil wine by turning it to vinegar. So there are lots of microbial fermentation applications in our everyday food. So um, Swiss cheese, 
So the holes that you see in Swiss cheese, when they don't actually go through and cut out all of those holes. Those are the remnants of the gas bubbles from the fermentation process. Next year also came up with the process of pasteurization. So he demonstrated that the bacteria that spoil our food and beverages could be killed by heat, um, but it wasn't hot enough to evaporate the alcohol in the wine or damage the overall um, food product or beverage product. So pasteurization is still used today. It's where we apply high heat for just a short amount of time, just long enough to kill those harmful bacteria that may be in the beverages. So we denature their enzyme protein so they can no longer grow and function right, to cause spoilage. Stemming from Pasteur's work in the 1860s that showed microbes are responsible for food spoilage um, and also disease, Joseph Lister came up with the concept of antiseptic surgery to prevent surgical wound infections, which were highly common back in this time. So think of the mouthwash Listerine, right? So it's an antiseptic mouthwash right? because Joseph Lister came up with the first antiseptic surgery. Robert Koch came up with Koch's postulates or experimental steps to prove a specific microbe is linked to a specific disease. Right? So what we refer to as the germ theory of disease, that this particular disease um, that we're seeing has to be caused by a particular microbe. So he did this by studying anthrax. So in this example, so we have an animal, a sheep, that has died from this mysterious disease. So we isolate microorganisms from the dead animal, and then we inject or inoculate a healthy animal with those same microorganisms. So if our healthy test animal presents with the same symptoms or dies, um, like our first animal, then we test for microorganisms in their blood as well. So if we find the same microorganisms in both animals, we can deduce that this microorganism is the causative agent of this disease. So this isn't always 100%. Right? There are some exceptions. Um, so some things are you can't really follow this step. Right? So ethical reasons or um, things with like viruses that are just really hard to culture in lab settings. But for the majority of known diseases, right, these postulates will apply. In the late 1700s, Edward Jenner inoculated the first person with cowpox virus. Right, so this was the first vaccine. So the cowpox virus is similar enough to the smallpox virus to um, induce an immunity to smallpox. So we did this by scraping pus from a cowpox pustule, um, making a small cut on his gardener's son's arm and then rubbing the pus right into that fresh wound. So the word vaccination is derived from the Latin word vacca, meaning cow, because our first vaccine came from cowpox. So the protection that you get from a vaccine is called immunity. Right? So if you ever encounter smallpox in the real world or in nature, you already have kind of a barrier and antibodies to protect you against it. So after this golden age of microbiology came the birth of modern chemotherapy. So scientists and researchers started to dream of what's referred to as a magic bullet. So we can find one chemical or one treatment right, or chemotherapy to treat this disease. So any chemical treatment of a disease is called chemotherapy, although normally you associate it with cancer treatment. Um, but technically, any chemical treatment of disease is chemotherapy. So some chemotherapy agents used to treat infectious disease could be either synthetic drugs that are manufactured in a laboratory or antibiotics that are produced by other living organisms. So antibiotics are chemicals produced by bacteria and fungi that help inhibit or kill other microbes. 
So different types of antibiotics have different modes of action or kind of plans of attack. So some antibiotics focus on attacking the cell wall. Um, some antibiotics attack protein synthesis capability. DNA synthesis, RNA synthesis, cell membrane, all of these are vital components to a living cell. So really, if you just take out one of these, right, you've probably uh, deactivated the whole cell. So one of the first modern antimicrobial drugs was salvarsin, um, an arsenic-based kind of, quote, magic bullet discovered by Paul Ehrlich, um, and it was used to treat syphilis. So back in these days, syphilis was much more prevalent and rampant. Um, so this was really considered kind of a holy grail medical treatment at the time. Also, quinine became widely used as anti-malarial um, after it was isolated from the bark of the quinchona tree. So a lot of our antimicrobial and chemotherapy treatments are derived from nature. Sulfonamides, antibiotics, were introduced in the 1930s, right? so they work by blocking that folic acid production in the bacteria. Another common uh, antibiotic, penicillin, so it attacks the formation of the cell wall in a bacteria. So if they can't form a cell wall, they can't form a fully functioning cell. So while a lot of our advances in microbiology and medicine right, were intentional, Right, so we were trying to search and research and find treatments. Um, one of our most groundbreaking advancements was discovered completely by accident. So Alexander Fleming in the 1920s accidentally discovered penicillin. He was trying to study the bacterial growth right, uh, and he left his plate open or somehow his plate got contaminated with a fungal penicillin colony. And he noticed that the area around this penicillin colony had no bacterial growth. So it was producing something that was inhibiting and keeping the bacteria away. So by the 1940s, penicillin has been clinically tested and mass produced. and is one of the most commonly prescribed antibiotics still to this day. So as much of a blessing as these advances in microbiology and medicine were, there also come some problems with these antimicrobial chemicals. So as we know today, overuse can lead to resistance. Right? So today, common issue, especially pressing in the near future, is antibiotic resistant bacteria. So how this happens, so you have lots of germs right, in a normal infection maybe a small percentage have mutated and are somehow now resistant to the drug. So you take the antibiotics um, that's going to kill the good bacteria, um, but the resistant bacteria is going to be left behind. So it's the last man standing. So now our resistant bacteria is the only one left to repopulate the colony. So now all the bacteria in our infection is drug resistant. And what's even more scary is that some bacteria can actually give their drug resistance to other bacteria. So they're able to kind of transform and transfer different genes. Some of these drugs that we use can be toxic to humans, so especially antivirals. So the way viruses work, um, some of them kind of hide in your own cells. So in order to kill the virus, you have to kill your own cells or destroy your own DNA. So this has led to um, what we're now into the third golden age of microbiology, starting from the late 1980s to the present. There are lots of different branches of microbiology. Um, so bacteriology is the study of bacteria, mycology is the study of fungi, parasitology, right, so the study of parasites um, and protozoan parasites. Virology would be the study of viruses. Um, immunology is the study of immunity. So where we use vaccines and things like interferons to prevent and cure viral diseases. So one of the major advances in the study of immunology occurred in the 1930s when Rebecca Lansfield was able to classify and distinguish between different types of pathogenic streptococci based on their cell wall components. 
Right? So this allowed us to be able to have more targeted approaches to our treatments. Um, so showing how vaccines work. So you get a weakened or a dead form of a virus or a bacteria um, and inject that into the body. So it's just enough to alert your immune response so that you develop antibodies, but it's not enough to actually make you sick and overwhelm your body system. So then if you actually do encounter this virus in the wild, in nature, you already have antibodies to help fight against it. Virology is the study of viruses. Right? So we said viruses are kind of in that gray area of biology and that they're not technically considered to be a living thing because they're not composed of cells. Right? But we do still study them right, because they can cause disease. So Iwanowski and Stanley were credited with discovering the cause of mosaic disease in tobacco crops to be a virus. They named the tobacco mosaic virus. So back at that time, tobacco was one of the number one cash crops in the world. So this mosaic disease was kind of a plague on these crops. So learning what caused it allowed them to help preserve their crops better. More modern times with the electron microscope have made it possible to study the structure of the viruses in actual detail. So these are real pictures of these viruses. So this is a bacteriophage. So this is a bacteria virus, uh, but that's what they actually look like. They look like little aliens almost. Um, and we'll talk later in the semester in the virus chapter about all the different structures of viruses, but they come in all shapes and sizes. Molecular genetics is another branch of microbiology. Um, that includes things like microbial genetics, so studying how microbes inherit their particular traits. Molecular biology studies how DNA directs protein synthesis. So DNA is kind of the blueprint or the recipe book for an organism. Right? So it's going to direct how to put those cells and tissues together. Genomics is the study of an organism's genes. So this has given us a lot of new tools for classifying microorganisms. So we can see how closely related different species are genetically that we may not have anticipated just by looking at their physical appearance. Recombinant DNA uh, is DNA that's recombined from two different sources. Uh, so in the 1960s, a scientist named Paul Berg was able to insert animal DNA into a bacterial DNA chromosome. And the bacteria actually was able to produce those animal proteins. So recombinant DNA is still widely used today in biotechnology. Um, it has lots of applications. Essentially how this works, so bacteria have bonus genes or an extra chromosome called a plasmid. So this is their primary chromosome they need to live. This is their kind of extra bonus one that could carry things like genes for um, antibiotic resistance or toxin production, capsule production, etc. So because these aren't kind of vital DNA, we're able to play around with them a little bit. So we can take this plasmid chromosome out of the bacteria um, and then we snip out the gene from say an animal cell that we're interested in. So say the, the gene for human growth hormone from a human cell. So we insert that into the plasmid. All right, so now we have a recombinant DNA plasmid. So we have DNA from two sources here. We put that plasmid back into the bacteria, and then we just let the bacteria do its thing. So it's going to grow in a culture, and right? it's going to make copies now of this plasmid DNA to pass on to the next generation of cells. So depending on what our end goal is, um, we could just harvest copies of this gene. So it would be a quick, easy way to get a lot of copies of a piece of DNA if you needed, that you could then use that DNA um, for other applications. So genes for pest resistance that could be inserted into plants or genes to alter bacteria for cleaning up things like oil spills. We could also have the bacteria just produce those proteins, right? So proteins produced, um, so our human growth hormone 
right, produced by the bacteria that we can then harvest the protein and use um, for medical treatments. Microbial ecology is the study of the relationship between microorganisms and the environment. So bacteria and microbes play a vital role to the entire ecosystem. They help by converting carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and other nutrients into forms that can be used by plants and animals. So they help break down and recycle these vital elements. They also help us digest our food. So we mentioned our normal microbiota, right? So your bacteria that live in your gut help to break down and digest your food um, that you wouldn't be able to produce enzymes to break down on your own. So we're able to get more nutrition from what we eat. And some of these microbes also help produce um, vitamins. So like vitamin K is produced by your gut bacteria. We also use microbes as bioremediation, right? To help clean up pollution. So a lot of bacteria naturally or be engineered to degrade certain waste products and pollutants. Um, so organic matter and sewage or pollutants like oil and mercury, right? so oil spills. Using bioremediation or these microbes to clean up these pollutants would be more beneficial than trying to treat it chemically or just dump more chemicals um, because these bacteria, these microbes are just going to digest these contaminants and use them for their own metabolism and the only waste products produced would be some co2 and water right? so virtually harmless uh, after products of this cleaning process bacteria microbes fungi and plants are all going to kind of work together to keep the ecosystem clean and healthy recombinant dna technology has really pave the way and open the door for all sorts of biotechnology applications. Biotechnology is just the use of microbes or any living organism or cell um, for basically our own human purposes, so producing foods and chemicals. So using that recombinant DNA technology, we're able to have bacteria or these fungi produce all types of proteins, even vaccines and enzymes. So there's potential for missing or defective genes in human cells that could be replaced using recombinant DNA technology uh, in gene therapy. We also currently widespread use uh, genetically modified bacteria to help protect our food crops from insects, um, freezing, or uh, pesticides and herbicides. So this example, um, so we have a gene with a desired trait that we want our plant to have that trait. So maybe this bacteria is resistant to a certain um, pesticide chemical. So we take this gene from the bacteria, right, and many copies of the gene would be inserted into the plant cells, and these plant cells would be encouraged to grow. So as they grow, they're going to make copies of that new gene. So now, plant will express that new trait. So this is an example showing our genetically modified eggplant versus our natural eggplant. So Bt is just a, um, a pesticide gene. Insects that try to eat this particular plant uh, would die. So you see the non-genetically modified eggplant has much more uh, damage to its fruits, right? not as much growth. Said microbes are normally present in and on the human body, and those are referred to as your normal microbiota. So they help us by uh, producing growth factors, some certain vitamins, helping us break down and digest our food, um, as well as preventing the growth of pathogens. Right? So if your good bacteria are using up all of your resources, there's not going to be anything left for those pathogens to want to hang around. When we talk about resistance, we're talking about the ability of the body to ward off disease. So some factors to disease resistance include the skin, um, stomach acid, antimicrobial chemicals, and this normal microbiota. Bacteria normally don't live in isolation in pure colonies. They live in communities with different cells. Um, so they generally are going to form what are called biofilms. So where microbes attach to a solid surface and then they begin to grow into masses. So they 
find a new homestead, right? They set down roots and then they build up their communities. So any solid surface, so rocks, pipes, teeth, medical implants, right, are all biofilms. So this is why you have to brush your teeth every day. So when your teeth start to have that fuzzy feeling, when it's time to brush your teeth, that's a biofilm. That's giving your teeth that kind of slick, slimy feeling. These biofilms can cause infections and are often resistant to antibiotics because the antibiotics are going to only affect the bacteria cells that are on the outer most portion of this biofilm. So all of the cells that are deeper down in the lower layers, they're more insulated and protected from the antibiotics. Whenever a pathogen invades a host and the host defense is not able to fight it off, right? so the pathogen has kind of overtaken the host cells. Um, so this is when disease results. Emerging infectious diseases are new diseases or diseases that are recently increasing in incidence and spreading more quickly, more widespread. So some common emerging infectious diseases, um, we've heard of SARS, right now known as the coronavirus, um, avian influenza or the bird flu, MRSA, that methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, uh, West Nile, transmitted by mosquitoes, uh, Ebola, and Zika were in the news a few years ago recently. Um, AIDS and HIV are also considered some emerging infectious diseases.